Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to MOAD's monthly program, Out As We See It. Thanks for joining us. Let us know where you're joining us from. Dimitri, Dimitri's on the chat. So yeah, let him know. All right, we'll give it a couple of seconds and then we'll start. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Kelly, Minneapolis. Oh my goodness. Thank you for joining us. El Cerrito. Wow. Baja Kingston, Emerville. Hi, Kimberly. Shari. Great. Thank you. I'm seeing familiar names. Yes. Hi. Oh, right. From London. Awesome. Great to great, great to see everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> my name is today, and I'm just thrilled to be in conversation with Kijo and Lucurisa today. And um and for uh, for folks here, um, Kijo Lee is MOAD's Chief uh, of Curatorial Affairs and Public Programs. And of course, I've got my colleague and friend, Lucrisa, here with me, who has been pretty much the heartbeat and the backbone of Art As We See It for the last two years. And we joke around and say, um, gift the pandemic gave us. Um, and also, I have Ronnie, Charlie, and Dimitri uh, mining the chat, so please communicate with them via chat. And so if this is your first time joining us, Art As We See It is a monthly program uh, where we get together and talk about art and music and really whatever comes to mind. Um, so we invite you to con uh, contribute to our discussion, to our conversation, as we look at art with wonder and curiosity. And if you're joining us on Facebook, uh, put your thoughts in, in the chat and we'll jump in and out of uh, Zoom, Zoom to check on you. In fact, Dimitri will. Um, we'll spend around one hour together discussing uh, one of Moab's current exhibitions, uh, Black Venus. And during that time, again, please don't hesitate to, to share your thoughts and comments with us uh, via chat. All right. Great. I see the chat is really going. Hey, Pamela. Wow, it's so nice to see uh, familiar names uh, there. All right, so Black Venus, uh, we have it on the second floor and the third floor, um, spanning from the second floor and third floor um, at Museum of the African Diaspora. It's curated by Andrea Emilife. And it's an exhibition that explores the legacy of Black women in visual culture. Um, it showcases the work of 18 artists from all around the globe and also spanning multiple generations from uh, the time spanning from 1942 to 1997. Um, and the exhibition looks into the historical fetishization, fetishization and othering of Black women. Um, also put together with archival depictions of Black women dating back to 1793. And we'll talk more about that um, as, as we delve into these conversations looking at each piece. Um, so just I just want to make sure that I also say that this exhibition deals with painful historical representations and ideas of Black womanhood. And some artwork presented mimic those images and language in order to shine a light on those histories, refute, reframe, and rec or reclaim those images, and um, to show how the history of art impacts how Black women and non-binary folks are understood and treated today. Um, so uh, we it's. <clears throat> there are some difficult pieces, there are some pieces that might bring up difficult emotions, uh, just to uh, kind of prepare you, feel free to take a break, and come, but come back. Um, all right. Question. Uh, when, you know, when, describe what you see in the chat, just put it in the chat for us, is describe what you see when you think of it. When you you know what you imagine when you think of the word Venus. You know, what does it sound like? What does it look like? 
Rodney says, planet. Dorothy says, white lady. Pamela says, yes, planet. Okay. Yeah. With blonde hair, Dorothy. Got it. Specific. Penelope says, the goddess. Yeah. Venus de Mila. Okay. Venus in, in first. Venus. De, okay. Milo. Not familiar. But... Okay. Great. Thank you for that. <clears throat> the beauty planet. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you, everyone, um, for putting your thoughts in the chat and, and for sharing that. And so we would like to, you know, as you walk in, actually, the first on the first floor, uh, there are these pillars and these poles that you see. And on one of them, um, there is the definition of the word black and the definition of Venus or the description of Venus. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add today. I hope it's Yes, okay. please. Um, yes. So these were this these were not meant to be summary definitions. They were just generalized definitions just to give folks an anchor as you're walking in so um uh to start a conceptual framework um around what Black Venus might encompass. But also I wanted to just ask, and I hope this is okay because I did not yeah. ask you first. Um, does everyone know what fetishization means? You can just say yes or no. I'm not going to ask you to define it if you say yes, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think so. Sure. Yes, would you like to hear my definition? So what? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I think that uh, just so that we are all sort of thinking around the same thing. So just as like a basic definition, I'm not leaning into the sort of academic historiography of the word. But to me, if I was just going to to think about it, I would say to someone who didn't know that it's the kind of flattening of an entire mm -hmm. being of a person into a specific sort of representation that becomes a tool to create a fantasy that allows for a bunch of different things, right? So that way we can think about it politically, we can think about it, how it gets used in literature, all these other ways. So it's a way that you sort of flatten someone into a usable talisman mm -hmm. or fetish. Um, uh, that that's, So it's not just the flattening into representation, it's then that representation becomes a tool right, that becomes an instrument of, of creating a framework for that being, right, in particular ways. It does have relation to cultural appropriation, absolutely. So there's a way in which um, there is a general fetishization of African cultures such that it makes more sense to um, uh, uh, render the works that would be considered living objects, right? Fetishes in a completely different sense into um, a, a representation of the actual action that they would be involved in if they weren't being preserved in, in Western collections. It's a very clunky thing, but there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Dimitri. <laughs> Thank you, Kijo. Thank you so much. Even you know, I, I've known the word. Um, <clears throat> I've known the word, but when you describe it, uh, describe it, I think it's important to to relearn things and also to hear to hear them like this. Because I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I did not know that. I, I I've used the word, but I didn't know that. So I appreciate that so much. Yeah. Also, I just thinking about uh, thinking about the um, the three categories of pillars that you gave us, reframe, resist, and reclaim. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Kijo? I'm, I'm really curious about that. Um, yeah. So in some ways, uh, we were thinking about, and I have to give credit to um, Salam Bakeli, who worked very closely with Andrea in 
thinking about how to design Black Venus specifically for um, specifically for um, Moad, given that uh, she had this this exhibition had traveled from Photographiska in New York, which is a photo photo gallery, contemporary art gallery, with a kind of self selecting photo specific audience that's really interested in the process of making each photograph and that sort of thing. And here at MOAD, there was the integration of other kinds of artworks beyond photographs, including prints, painting, sculpture, um, film. Um, and so the thought was, how do we capture that shift? Because at Photograph Visca, the walls were all red to sort of imply rage. Um, at 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 the at the sort of historical legacy of the um, images that Andrea was presenting. So the three anchors are, and the sable Venus, um, the hot and top Venus, um, and uh, uh, Josephine Baker as also who's also called Black Venus. Um, and so for he for us, um, Salam uh, devised a scheme in which we could think about three different themes anchored by three different colors. So the purple is meant to refer to royalty um, and, and power. So historically in many cultures, uh, royal blue or purple violet um, have been used to indicate royalty and or significant power. Um, red, which was to indicate blood, um, passion and rage that's invested in the desire to refute or undermine um, these histories. Um, and then uh, brown, which was to reflect an intimacy with Black women's flesh and skin. So each of those themes was meant to just give uh, visitors a framework right, to think about, because we want to think about the whole experience when you're entering the galleries. Often you'll see all white walls, and it can seem like that's just because it's easiest, but often it's 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 to showcase works in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But if you encounter a lot of color, everything is for a reason. And so we wanted to think about how we are helping to frame, right, your experience of each artwork. Yeah, okay, Joe, you know, um... A little embarrassed to show myself, but just to kind of show what it's like to walk into the galleries. And this is a one minute snippet. So this is just to give an idea of what it's like as you get off the elevator and you, you'll be able to see these colors that Kijo just described um, as well. A shout out to our marketing team, by the way, for making this happen. Um, There's no sound on the video. There's kind of a wind chime sound, but that's pretty much it. This is sort of to give us an idea of scale and also how these colors have been used um, all throughout the museum. Um, so yeah, you know, the first the first piece is not, um, it's an archival piece and I wanted us to sort of talk about this one of um, the voyage of Sa the Sable Venus from Mongolia. And so what do folks think immediately when you see this? What are your thoughts? What do you notice? Mm 
Venus is very prevalent. Yes, Kamala, Venus appears to be the only non-white person. Hmm. Struck by the sherbs, yes. Everyone white but Venus. The reference to Botticelli's Venus on the half shell. She's protected, cared for by the spirits and angels, Penelope. Dorothy, I love seeing this since I had never seen it before. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for your reaction and also your, um, you know, your connection, making the connections um, with other artwork as well. So, yeah, this this is a, a reproduction of um, 19th century engraving, and this is meant to be a propaganda. This is a propaganda piece. Um, if you notice that, if you notice that this this god, which I believe is um, god of the waters, I want to say. Um, is holding the the British flag, and if you kind of look around as you as you made uh, the note, the Venus is the only uh, black person in all of this, and this is to pro to, this was to promote the transatlantic slave trade, uh, referring to uh, Jamaica. And so this is the voyage of the sable Venus, I believe, uh, from Angola to the West Indies. Is um, is mentioning Jamaica and uh, alluding to Jamaica or the um, tra the transatlantic um, uh, slave trade um, at that stop, right? And so um, it's based on a, a really tasteless poem that uh, to use the word fetishizes and also less um, kind of less full uh, poem. Um, and it's it's called the Sable Venus, an ode. Um, and the figure that originated in the 17th and 18th century uh, is basically drawing the, the poetry on this work. And I would like to ask Kijo to, to contribute to this conversation also, since someone mentioned Botticelli's um, yes. birth of Venus. I want to bring this up. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, so, I mean, first, Yes, Neptune, um, or the Greek version or the Roman version, you know. Um, also, I just want to say that the Voyage of the Sable Venus is an 18th century engraving. So, okay. um, so uh, yeah, so uh, 1793, um, Thomas Stoddard. So it's contiguous with, um, and it is referring to Jamaica in the West Indies, um, where uh, sugar plantations and things of that nature were occurring that was also the famous site of um, a plantation of a man named Thomas Thistlewood. Um, and so it's really interesting to me because I see what you all are saying, how the cherubs seem protective in that arc right around the top of, of Venus. Um, there is this way in which uh, she seems to be surrounded um, but I want you to notice, and there you did that close up, that there are, she has wrist and anklets. So these are um, tropes or these are characteristics showing her as enslaved, as well as that uh, rope or tether that seems to be linking her to the uh, cherubs and down into the sea, um, as well as right the neck band. Um, and then if we go to that image uh, of Botticelli's Venus, um, so we can see where there's some comparisons, right? So we see that uh, we have the open oyster shell. Um, we see this way in which Venus is, uh, well, what do you see when you look at, at this one? And definitely music today. So, <laughs> so what do you all see when you look at this version um, of Botticelli's Birth of Venus? Oh, I see that someone said that Botticelli's Venus is covering herself. This is actually 
an art historical pose called the Venus Pudica. And it's basically the, the Venus modesty pose. Exactly. And it's meant to cover what was what considered naughty bits. So, and what do you see that makes you say looks like purity, Dorothy? What specifically looks like purity here? We see them, we said the modest sort of covering of herself. Is there anything else? The blonde hair, anything else? Covering herself, absolutely. And so if we go back to the sable Venus, so Botticelli's Venus seems to be being moved just by the gentle breeze of the blowing of the angels in the sky. There's um, a bit more of the tumult of the uh, waves that are rolling here. What has to bring her from Angola to the West Indies uh, is the British Empire, um, which you have in the figure of Neptune, right? The king of the seas. Um, there's also... Uh, a really interesting thing happening with this sort of falling cherub. We don't need to get into that today. But what we're also seeing is that the shell itself isn't that clean, white, open, and pristine. The uh, clam still is inside the shell, right? So there is this, uh, uh, and the clam shell can also refer to sort of fertility and fecundity, right? So Botticelli's Venus is, is very clean and open and meant to be producing all of a particular kind of child. Um, uh, there's a little bit less of that um, uh, pristine quality in the shell of, of the Sable Venus. It's not like she, so the Sable Venus wasn't just birthed from the sea, perfectly formed in this way. There are still remnants of the sea surrounding and involved with our Sable Venus. Um, that one looks a little bit more tumultuous. Yes, adults instead of children surrounding Botticelli's. Yes, so there's not that reflection of the cherubim um, all around uh, uh, Botticelli's Venus. So there's some distinctions here, but this, uh, excuse me, Stoddard was definitely looking at Botticelli's Venus and thinking about how to translate that imagery, which all of his audience would have been aware of. Hmm. utilizing um, a Black feminine figure, but also the, the Sable Venus is much more muscular. Now, Botticelli's uh, Venus is no slouch, right? But there's a much more softness to the figuration um, in Botticelli's Venus. There is a muscularity in, um, in the Sable Venus that uh, is missing from Botticelli. Um, in Botticelli, the woman on the right is is bringing her clothing right so ready to sort of cloak her in what is necessary to right bring her from the sea onto land um the idea of religious conversion forced upon a new world i'd love to hear more about that pf uh black body made less feminine this is something we see very often but it's also the case that if you were to look at michelangelo's women they often look like sculptures of bulky men with very round breasts just onto the front. Um, and he was in fact using male models and looking to statuary. So yes, but also there is this idea of the masculinization of black women's bodies because they were meant to be bred um, in really particular ways. Uh, thank you. Music, yeah. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kija. Uh, yes. Lucrisa and I had been in, you know, it, it, been talking about the the two pieces, right? They're just looking at Botticelli's and looking at this this one, uh, the the Voyage of the Sable Venus, and um, a lot of the things that folks pointed out. It, it we were thinking, you know, in in terms of wow, the the sea, the sea looks very tumultuous, kind of like what Dorothy said, and, and uh, little by little, just kind of understanding uh, where this is coming from. So thank you for that. Also, um, oh, PF says, angels as an indicative of Christianity and the erasure mm. of native indigenous belief system, both in Africa and in New World. Mm. Definitely a different way to see it. Thank you for that. I, I did not think about that when I was looking at this this at all and Sue says black Venus looks like she'd prefer not to be there while mm. white Venus looks quite neutral mm. wow yeah thank you I did not think we were going to spend this much time on this one but I'm <laughs> glad we're doing uh, we're doing that 
Um, moving on to Ayana V. Jackson's work, and just for folks that that look forward to the music, um, it was I, I'll be honest, it was really difficult to find music for some of these pieces after having understood uh, the the things that they reckon with or the ideas that they reckon with. So for me, uh, it made sense as. Um, Florence Price would say no music with no words. So um, uh, thinking about classical music and cl uh, thinking about even further uh, Black women's contribution to classical music in, in the role of, uh, of not, not, uh, uh, composers. And so uh, we're going to listen to four, four small pieces, but when the follow-up email comes, uh, be on the lookout for playlists. And so... Yeah, I just want to say that because I know this is a music and art program. Um, this one we have not paired with music, but let's look at it as um, as a work. What is happening? What's going on? What are your thoughts? Yeah, what do you see? Thanks, Dimitri. Sherry says, even without seeing her face, she looks beautiful and dignified. Rodney says, I love the black background. Sherry, is the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. I, what do you see that makes you say dignified, mm -hmm. Sherry? What about without seeing her face, because usually, of course, we would be reading her face for those cues. A proud stature. Mm -hmm. So one thing you're gonna learn about me is I'm gonna press you like I would press my students. So what specifically <laughs> about the figure looks proud? Her hands, especially her left, very relaxed and confident. Yes, so there's no clenching. Specifically, absolutely great. Squared shoulders, excellent, uh, uh, Sue. Prideful pose. So Dorothy, what do you see that makes you say prideful? What shapes, what is this figure's body doing that says pride? Because these are some of the things when we start to back strength, yes. Chin tilted up, absolutely. Head up, exactly. So if you were to, I can't see you on the camera. If you were to do adopt that pose, then what does that feel like? Then I get the prideful. Then I get that, yes, absolutely. Because we don't want to make any assumptions that everybody has that same impression of this pose, right? Regal, yeah, no slouching, absolutely. Sorry, take it away, Sadez. No, <laughs> okay. So I'm surprised uh, to, to see to see the chat because in my immediate reaction when I saw this without knowing the background mm. is I, I don't I don't know I, I don't know if if it's pride or I don't I I didn't feel like it was a it was pride that I was seeing. Lucrisa, <laughs> what was your reaction? No, I, I think you and I discussed it. And initially yeah. I did kind of feel that it was, you know, kind of graceful and, um, you know, yes, there was this kind of sense of pride and you could tell by the, the or thought I could tell by the um, the way her stature is, her shoulders, you know, being squared back and the, you know, her, her back being rigid. And so, yes, initially that was, that was my impression. Okay, see, so maybe because the seat doesn't look so comfortable for me, <laughs> but then we go back to the the you know I've I've heard the classical pose and something that I learned from Kijo's book actually, <laughs> uh, and, and what's the term? It's the German term. Uh, oh, oh yes, mm -hmm. the the Rücken figure. Rücken figure, yeah, the Rücken figure. Means the figure turned away from the viewer, but there's like several things happen, like there's several of those kinds of tropes happening here. So I'm with you today because 
it doesn't because she looks posed mm. right the seat isn't so comfortable the background is beautiful it is you're right someone said perfect model for the artist right so for me this doesn't feel as volitional right or as as much her decision as the photographer. Now, this is me, me projecting completely and making an assumption, but those cues don't necessarily say to me about uh, that this is a picture about her. To me, it's a picture about women, womanhood, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's a picture about beauty, this kind of thing, maybe. Mm. Kim says she's on the edge of the seat. Um, so she doesn't look quite comfortable. So those were the things, but that doesn't mean that these ideas around her looking prideful, looking confident, all of those directions, all of those angles are still true, right? Mm -hmm. It's just still everything always bears closer looking. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so here's the thing though, the minute I learned about Anarka, and of course, Ayanna V. Jackson would do something, would make something like that, because I, th I think she's a historian, if I can say that, or uh, mm -hmm. she, I, I feel like she delves so deep into these stories of forgotten people, well, not forgotten people, but we don't hear the stories um, all too much. And she, uh, the representation of black, black bodies is important to Ayanna V. Jackson, who, by the way, is the artist and the model in this, um, in this work. Um, and to think about Anarka, is anyone familiar with the story of Anarka? Hmm. It, okay, anybody? All right. Anybody familiar with this with this artwork? Mm, Doreen, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, Doreen says, uh, this picture reminds me of how, and I, it's referring, um, Doreen is referring to this image. This, uh, this picture refer, uh, reminds me of how slave women were stripped down when they were being sold. The difference is that she doesn't have any whipping marks on her back. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah, there's a conversation happening in the in the chat right now. But moving on to Anarka, uh, speaking, you know, talking about Anarka, and I would like to invite Lucrisa to uh, to help me with with this one. But Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy were three um, enslaved women. Um, they were young. I I mean, even to even believe that they they could be called women is kind of hard for me to imagine. Um, who lived and work um, on different plantations near Montgomery, Alabama. And um, in the 1840s, um, all women developed uh, a painful medical condition after childbirth called fistula, which you know, in the US, I don't hear it happen so much or in the global, usually in the global South that I hear that this happens. And it happens when young um, young women give birth and there is a complication uh, because of the not fully developed um, uh, birth parts, I would say. I'm not a medical person, forgive me for that. And so, um, it, you know, it, it, it makes the, the mother lose control of the bladder and the bowels. And uh, these enslaved women were not, you know, looking at it from from their their point also i would uh i can't i can't even look at look at it from their point but i i would say the enslavers were sort of losing money sort of losing labor time from these girls from these women and so they were searching for solutions which in which time uh doctor you know he's he's called the father of modern gynecology i guess um is uh, Dr. Um, Marion Sims. I don't know if he's, he, and he, 
promises to heal these women in six months time to get them back to normal so they can get back get back to work type of deal and lo and behold long story short long and treacherous story um but they end up staying for five years and Arnarka was one of the girls that they experimented with and you know she was subject to uh 30 or more uh, operations without anesthesia and the girls had to take care of each other um, since other folks were not allowed uh, to take care of them and, and so the image that you see here um, is sort of a document of the only documentation that we know um, visual documentation that I know of of Ar Anarka so yeah any and Going back to the image that we just looked at and talked about um, Ayana V. Jackson's work, what are people's thoughts? I think for me, um, yeah. Sade, you yeah. know, after hearing uh, the story that that you shared with me um, about Anarka, um, this became a, a, just a very different uh, photograph. You know, now it became um, a, a point of reclaiming uh, one's um, womanhood and uh, taking power over how the body is treated and who gets to do what to the body, who gets to see what, you know? Um, in in um, Anarkar's uh, 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 place, she had no control over that, you know, mm -hmm. she was operated, as you said, on, you know, several times and without anesthesia, and she had no control. When I see this now, knowing the story, I see this as a photograph of her taking back the control that had been taken from her. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. And, and I think in some ways yeah. that Ayana's point is, mm -hmm. is really considering what it means for her to take control of the camera, right? And that's also an idea that originated in the 1840s when Frederick Douglass was, you know, photography like that looks like what we know it to be now began in 1839 with the daguerreotype. By 1850, Frederick Douglass was telling black folks that the biggest antidote to the ways that we were understood was but was having ourselves photographed because uh, image could not be manipulated in the same way that a painting or sculpture mm -hmm. could, right? To exaggerate our features into caricature. So there's a way in which um, Ayana is also stepping into this legacy of photography, which was technologically already biased because it's biased and made to think about light, how black folks would be able to utilize that technology for liberatory purposes. Yes. Yes. How is this one? And you know what? I was able to hear this music and kind of connect it and I hope it does that for you as well and this is the same artist Ayana, Ayana V. Jackson and listen listen to the music it's only 30 seconds Um, it's um, composer Zenobia Powell Perry, and uh, the uh, the piano is by Maya, um, Dr. Maya Cordley. Um, and uh, uh, Zenobia Powell Perry is, it's called Homage, and Zenobia Powell Perry is one of the, um, I would say, the mothers of Black classical music who incorporated uh, uh, Black spirituals and jazz into a very rigid 
uh, classical music, right? Very rigid and very structured space, uh, introducing jazz and um, jazz, which um, has a, a improvis improvisational uh, qualities to it and to take it to this rigid and imagine kind of this staccato, this kind of thing and putting that and combining it to honor uh, to honor the spirituals that she grew up around and the uh, the jazz music she grew, she um, she was around and so yeah to to honor Zenobia Paul Perry one of our our um, mother of black music black composers of classical music yeah and what do folks think about about this piece Lucris I'll let you lead this one please well when I first saw this I mean I was struck just merely by the fashion part of it I just thought this is a fantastic costume I mean and it you know it fits her perfectly of course it was made for her but it, it's just I mean just to look at it and think nothing else just looking at it it's beautiful absolutely beautiful then after I looked at that and I was and I, I kind of moved away from that, I started to kind of, you know, do a little reading about um, what this this uh, photograph was all about. And so first I want to say that this is um, Ayanna Jackson as well. Um, and typically she did a lot of photographs like we just saw uh, previously on kind of uh, the, the colonial look or gaze um, upon the, the female black body. And so this kind of actually was a departure from her realist uh, kind of approach to a more mythological approach. And so she actually said that she was inspired by the Afrofuturism of Sun Ra and by, this name is gonna get me, I know it, Drexia's, I believe it's called. Drexia. Drexia, thank you. Um, the Drexia narrative um, to reclaim and re, kind of rewrite the terrors of the Middle Passage. And mm -hmm. so Drexia is actually a myth about, um, people, uh, women who were thrown overboard during the um, Middle Passage um, who were pregnant, that their babies actually mm. were born underwater and created this, this world, this mythological world uh, below water. And so when she approached this piece, her thoughts were, what would it have been like to have fallen off that those boats? What would have capsized? What um, what would they have available to them to to them to to dress themselves? And so she, you know, went from this point of view. Uh, as you can see, I, I'm sorry, uh, today can you do kind of like a close up? Um, the bodice of of this dress was, is made out of spoons, and the flowing part of the dressers is made out of flip-flops. And so in her mind, these were things that would have been thrown in the water that these group of people in Drexia um, would use to close themselves and to live. And I just thought, I absolutely love that story. And then she, you know, she brought another question and she said, you know, why is it that I know about Greek mythology and Roman mythology, but I know nothing of African mythology. And when we think about African mythology, it's always in a demonized fashion. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted to kind of bring that in as well and say that we have our own mythology. We have our own spirituality, which we have been separated from constantly, you know, with it being demonized. And so she wanted to bring that whole process um, into this piece. So I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. Ooh, thank you, Lucrisa. Wow. I just wanted to add, because Drexia, yeah. that's one of my favorite myths in it. The originators are actually an 80s Black electronica band by the same name, Drexia. And they devised that myth, which has now become this incredible 
device that so many artists are using to think through, right? A new, a different kind of origin story. And to my mind, Lucrecia, it's also allows for um, uh, uh, enslaved, you know, the, the, the descendants of the formerly enslaved to not only anchor our origins on the African continent, right? So, you know, it allows for a different way of orienting ourselves where in the sea doesn't become this strange tabula rasa where everything was lost, but instead is a space of syncretism, like a space of mixing and blending um, rather than of loss. Exactly. And also just, and also just, you know, she, she had the mindset about um, all of the different um, water spirits in you know the various African uh, traditions, you know, like Yemenya and Oya, and so she kind of brings all of that in to her her process of being inspired to do this. That's great! Wow, great! Thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay, see, we've only gotten through a couple of pieces, but I couldn't I couldn't wait for this one. And Lucrisa, I just. I know that you really like this piece. So yeah, please lead us in this conversation. Well, I, I just, you know, first of all, I was taken um, by the fact that this is a photograph that she, uh, that Ming Smith, the photographer, ultimately um, started collaging and putting paint to, to the photograph. And, you know, so I was curious as to why, why she would do this. Well, you know, reading a bit about Ming, one of her things was movement. She always wanted to infuse some type of movement into her pieces. But I wanted, before I kind of get into that, I wanted to give a, a quick little story. Um, at the time that she did this photograph, she was not one for really, uh, uh, photographing celebrity, you know, mm. she was into doing her, her photography about how she saw the world, her reality, and, you know, how she viewed Black people, and so she, she, she stuck to that, but she became friends with Grace Jones, she said she didn't have many friends, and most of the friends that she did have, she met in, in the hair salon, and so she met Grace Jones, they became friends, because, you know, Grace was, was, is, was, and is so, such a huge personality, and so different, and, um, challenging to the status quo and Ming felt that she herself was you know just not a part of uh, society in any meaningful way and so they would they became friends they would sit for hours and have conversations you know about life in general and so um, Grace had been in Paris and when she came back to came back from Paris she was invited to perform at Studio 54 and so she calls up Ming and says hey why don't you come and you know photograph me while I'm doing my thing and so Ming was like well yeah I don't really had the money to, to be getting in there so Grace says oh hey I'll put your name on the on the list you know just come bring your camera and so that's really how this came into play it wasn't that you know Ming was trying to get into photographing celebrity grace was simply her friend who asked her to do her a favor and i just thought that was great yeah. so as i say you know one of Ming's things is to infuse movement into her pieces can you go back to that to that prior one yes so this is the original photograph and you know as we can see i mean it it captures grace being who she is you know she has the scarf she's she's grooving she i love the strong jaw that she has you you know you see the the body and the strength that's in the body you see people who are gazing at her but i guess that was not enough for me she needed to have the movement and so then she went and she started adding some collage pieces where you can see like what appears to be flowers on top of the woman's head on the right and she has this pink and I just thought it was fabulous that she chose pink because we look at pink as being kind of this this color that that expresses feminism which you know it's kind of like the direct opposite of what Grace usually portrays herself as and so you have this pink and you have this movement and I just thought this is fabulous you know it's like okay I I got the, the photo I'm not quite happy with it I need some more and this is what I'm going to do to change this look I love it Yes, I, I absolutely love it. You actually, 
Look, Risa, I think you helped me love it. I was liking it, sort of liking it. And then you you made me love it. So thank you so much for that. And uh, a couple more pieces. Now let's look at this one. This piece is about 15 minutes long and I'll send you the link and it is such a treat to listen to. Um, but just listening to the whole music just really paired really well for this piece. Um, and it's called Dirge and Deliverance and the composer is Dorothy Redmore. And um, please look her up, um, amazing pieces um, uh, out there. Great, great music. And looking at this work now, just, you know, it, it took me a moment to just sit down and take on it, you know, they're just, it's a, it's a dip take. It's just two things, two, one body and one plate with words. Uh, but it took me a while to kind of take it apart and digest all of the messages. And I still think there's a whole lot more to unpack um, and then we move on to the title of this piece, and it adds another layer of meaning to, to this work. And this is by Lorna Simpson. So in this, in this one, I wonder, and I'm really curious what people are, what people think, and me, what your, what's your immediate reaction to this? What are we looking at? What's your immediate reaction? Herbs, PF says. Yeah. And I think PF, I, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean about the composition in this piece also and the tying of the, the diptych. Yeah. Or this, the sums of the society in the United States. Yes. Ooh, we can talk about that for a long time. <laughs> Rodney says a political message. Ronnie, what 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 do you mean by that? Well, yeah, it seems to show that black women are servants. Well, yes, and you know, um, it's it it says not good enough, but good enough to serve, and to think about how food, the food that Black women or cooks, Black cooks would prepare for the enslavers um, would not be the same food that they would eat. To this day, we have um, diets that are based on this, this structure, right? The, so the, um, so Lorna is saying that, you know, what you cook is not what you eat exactly. What you cook for others is not necessarily what, what, you cook. Uh, so you could not eat the same food or use the same dishes as the white families uh, that they were serving. And so to think about that, and, uh, and what she does beautifully here is also put a bow on this whole thing by calling it sea ration. And sea ration, for those who, who may not know, um, is the food that was given to US soldiers in 1940s and 50s uh, when they were in combat. And so um, the word serve kind of takes a different meaning as you kind of go back to the piece and look at it. And so, oh, but good enough to serve, not good enough here. So we, we talk, we, we, when we think about the GI Bill that really screwed up people's lives, um, you know, uh, when we think about uh, Black soldiers fighting, um, 
in in wars in in the, outside of the U.S. for the United States, but coming back to a country that doesn't necessarily treat them like they're they're um, that they're citizens. So thinking about all of that in the word serve um, um, in this is such an interesting way of artwork working really well with titles. Sometimes we see untitled. Uh, but this one takes it right out, you know, it extends beyond and goes to the walls um, in the gallery. Yeah. Oh, I see that. I, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Well, I was just going to make two two comments. One yes, of them please. is that when I first saw this and I mean, just the words of loan, of course, as, mm. as, as you have uh, discussed, it's just like, oh, my gosh. Um, mm. But then I'm looking at this plate. And it's it's a disposable plate. Is it? And it just honest well, it, to me it appears to be huh. a disposable plate. Yeah. And it just kind of took me to a place of how enslaved people were kind of thought of as disposable. Oh, you know, wow. you have one and you know, you beat them and you beat them to death and you just go get another one, just kind of. So it it really took me to a, a dark place um, as I looked at this. And I also have to say that I found it really interesting how mm -hmm. initially I saw this as how Black women were faceless because you only see a portion of her face. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that they were faceless, nameless servants serving white master. And I recognized within myself, and this was really just kind of like eye-opening, I recognized mm -hmm. within myself that really and truly that was kind of a part of the colonial mindset. Mm -hmm. And so I found it intriguing for me to look at it in a broader sense in that I started to think, you know, the, 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 about the phrase, the eyes are the mirror of the soul and how we lower our eyes or look away when we don't want someone to sense what we're really seeing and feeling. And so then it became kind of a photograph of empowerment. Mm -hmm. You don't get to see what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling unless I allow you to see it. And so it just kind of, I went from one, <laughs> one, you know, one side of the, the spectrum all the way to the other side of the spectrum, just in just looking at this photograph. I think it's such a powerful, powerful photograph and statement. And it has so many layers to it that you could just take, you know, hours looking at it and allowing yourself to really think about what the photographer was getting across to us. I agree. Oh, that's that's in 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 the the plate being, you know, is is it real plate? Is it, is it um disposable plate that now I, I've got that on, on my mind and also why we don't see her eyes uh, or the person's eyes in this uh, why we don't see that thank you so much uh, also, Luke, I that, I, yeah I, would be remiss Go ahead. If I didn't add that Lorna was also playing around with our histories mm -hmm. like thinking about Magritte Ce n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. So there are these ways in which she's playing around with all of these things. And then by, and what does it mean when we add the layer of who is doing the making, right? Yes. So in some ways, that's the subtext of the whole exhibition. If we were to look at this image and all of a sudden discover that it were a white man that produced this image, it would have a whole different valence, right? Mm. And not do the same kind of work. Does it mean that that white artist could not produce these images? Yes, but there is a way that there is a non-neutral, that, that, that it is non-neutral, right? So there's a way in which that all gets tied up into the interpretive process that we've been doing today, right? Is thinking about how these artists, by taking claim of the camera, by actually disrupting what we're so used to seeing and by whom we're used to seeing those images produced that actually shifts how we understand and hopefully how black women get understood in our in our everyday lives yes thank you so much that is a beautiful ending and one last piece i want to share with folks because lucrisa would not talk to me if i don't <laughs> i know it's three o'clock but i would like to um 
just share this piece. Okay, this piece is by Pamela Z. Well, not, not the artwork, but the music. Uh, is an American composer, performer, and media artist um, who's best known for her solo work with voice and electronic processing. So thinking about taking uh, those structured old ways of, um, of doing music and taking it to the electronics and voice and, and really playing around with it. And she is a pie, sort of a pioneer in that. So um, shout out to Pamela, Pamela Z. Um, and so I wanted to just highlight this piece, invite you to come and visit the uh, um, the exhibition, please check it out. We could close this on August 22nd and we're open, um, check out our website and we're open um, four days out of, uh, five days out of the week um, and come and visit us. And we'll be back in a month with reggae music and art. And I would like to say thank you so much for Kijo, Lucurisa, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your insights and and all the the, the things you brought today for us. And Luke, and Dimitri, Rodney, and Charlie, thank you for for uh, managing the chat. We'll see you in a month. Um, I hope to see you all in the galleries. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Bye, team. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.